Tom, how's it going? Hello, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Cool. Uh, just to let you know in this game, uh, I'm the Gangplank. Sure, okay. Cool, cool. Um, let's go ahead and share the screen. So let me know when you can see the screen. Uh, yeah, I've got the screen now. Cool. Alright, so you're playing Gangplank this game. Uh, yeah, I um, I was in one of your streams the other day and uh, I asked you how strong you thought he was and uh, you said he was really strong at the moment, so I thought I'd give him a go. How's it going for you? Uh, it's alright, I'm still a bit uh, iffy on the uh, barrels though. Cool, yeah, I'll give you some tips on that. There's some really cool things you can do with Gangplank top lane using the bushes with your barrels and trades. Um, That'll definitely help you out a bit. Not when it comes up, I'll I'll uh, I'll talk to you about it. So the level one with with gangplank and especially a top laner is really important. Are you at an elo where your junglers are asking a double jungle? Uh, no, I'm at plat three at the moment. Okay. Do you know how to double jungle? Uh, no, I haven't really learned how to uh, double jungle. Okay. So let me just go over double jungling really quickly. Um, your, your jungler is actually on the side that double jungling would work really well for on blue side. So the way double jungling works is the top laner tanks the gromp or it tanks whatever buff you're starting on. Usually it's a small camp then a big camp. So it would be like gromp and blue or doing krugs and red for the opposite side. And as a top laner, you tank it because you're going to go back and you both share the golden experience. So for this, on this side, what would happen, it would be like you would tank it for Scion and you'd both be killing it. And then you'd share the experience for it. You'd let uh, the Scion have experience for the big, or for this camp, the big one, the Grom. And then when you go to blue, you'd still tank it, but you take the small, you take the gold for the small ones, and then you still help tank. And if you get low, then you, you back up for a second, but still help kill it. It makes your jungler jungle faster. And as a top laner, it means you could do a jungle camp um, pretty easily. Like Gangplank can still solo a jungle camp. So if you're not going to double jungle and you have teleport, I would highly recommend starting a jungle camp either Wolves or Wraiths. Wolves are the easiest uh, for Gangplank since he doesn't have as much AoE. So as a top laner, definitely look into doing either uh, double jungle with your jungler, and it really helps out your jungler because you have high HP, it allows him to gank more frequently, or to do a jungle camp. Um, it might be kind of hard since uh, this Scion wants you to leash, but like if your bottom lane is not going to take a jungle camp, then uh, you're... you're Scion should probably start bottom side, but no. um, you know it can be kind of confusing in lower brackets to play because they aren't like utilizing the jungle camps fully. But double jungling is also beneficial because you know if you're gonna have to leash your your top lane or your jungler because your bottom lane is wanting to do Krugs or that camp on that side, then like your jungler still gets a good leash. Um, but you're yeah. gonna yeah. Yeah, I did try um, doing the Krugs once when I was on the other side, but I found it quite hard with uh, Gangplank because you got quite low. You just have to start Doran's Blade and do Wolves. Okay. You, you start Doran's Blade, do Wolves, kill the small wolves first, and then focus the big wolf. And you'll be able to do it easy peasy. Um, you don't have to take anything too special. Just start Doran's Blade, and uh, it won't be too bad. Um, so this game you started Flask. Now, the other benefits of doing a jungle camp at level 1 is that um, you can start Doran's Blade and come back with 5 health potions, 1 mana potion. And you're able to start Doran's Blade. And on something like Gangplank, being able to start Doran's Blade just gives you that innate sustain in lane in addition to that extra damage. So it can really turn around trades on something like a Riven if you were to come to lane already level 2 with a Doran's Blade and more potions than her, she would get bullied out of lane really fast. But starting Flask is still okay, it's just most of the time when you're playing top lane, from now on I want you to start either double jungling with your jungler or doing a jungle camp at level 1. It will really help you out. Yeah, okay, I'll try that because um, every game I've played him, I've always gone for the uh, Crystalline Flask because going straight into lane with Doran's, I didn't feel was very strong. Yeah, if you don't do a jungle camp, it's not strong, but the benefit of doing the jungle camp is you'll have the Doran's Blade, you'll do the jungle camp faster because you have the Doran's Blade, and then you teleport top with five health potions and Doran's Blade. So the main issues with going to lane with Doran's Blade is that you don't have enough potions. That's why you do a jungle camp as Gangplank, and the wolf camp is your friend. Definitely want to do wolves. So, would you recommend doing Krugs or uh, going down to do the uh, sort of the rights? No, no, there? always wolves, always, always wolves. wolves, always wolves. Krugs, I would never do Krugs. It's only Raptors or wolves as a top laner. Okay. The the Krugs are really hard to do most of the time. Okay, so talking about laning phase, let's go back a little bit since we were still talking. Um, 
the trick is going to be to trade on Riven whenever she uses her E. And this is really important for anyone laning against a Riven. If she uses her E like she ju just did right now when you don't Q her, that is your time timing window to Q her. So anytime she uses her E ability to farm, that's her shield. That's how she's going to win trades against you. Is she's going to try to shield every single time you Q her. But if you wait or like bait it out, like you move towards her and she like shields back thinking you're going to Q her, and then you Q her after, that's how you start accruing an advantage in this lane. The next part is I want you to start taking control of these bushes with your barrels. So what you do is you're going to have, like, if the lane is more centered like it is right now, it's, it's a little bit harder. But a lot of times you can, like, put a barrel in that bush, if you can see where my cursor is right now, oh, or, yeah. or this bush. And then your next barrel is what you extend out. So, like, you still want to connect them, but the next barrel, um, like, this one will time to one. And then you just place out a new barrel, and then you cue the original one in the bush. They won't see that barrel, and they might forget about it, and, like, that's how you get great trades off with your barrel is you really utilize the bushes with gangplank and uh, i played against some good gangplanks that did that to me and it's really hard because riven won't have like vision of this bush she won't see like she won't be able to always be able to mentally see like the radius from that original barrel in the bush and then like thinking about how it's going to be extended from the next one yeah the thing i try to do in this game is because um i know riven's melee i try to stick barrels in my minions so if she wanted to farm she had to come into the minions right and then into my barrel so no that's that's also yeah. the next step like when you're playing gangplank versus uh melee champions you always like will put the barrel as a zoning device like how you did it right here is okay but the trade leading up until this play needs a little bit trimming up so let's try to get to this play again um, so at this point, like you're running past the ribbon going into her minions. Now this is a mistake because this is where she should have fought you. Um, if you turned and started hitting her, all of her minions would start focusing you. And the trades top lane need to have like a really good idea behind like where your minions are versus where their minions are. Because if you for some reason start all inning the, the ribbon or she starts to all in you, the retaliation is in her favor. Like, your minions won't be able to get in range to help you. Like, the radius for call to help for minions is pretty short. Like, your range caster minions and your siege minion will not come to help you if Ribbon's hitting you where you currently are, but hers will. So when you ran past her to get to these minions, like, this is where she should have just started auto-attacking you. And just, like, this is where a huge punishment would have happened, probably losing most of your health. Um, in a higher elo game, this is, like... This is where the mistake would be that would cause like a chain reaction to, to lead to first blood. So really be aware of that. Don't position yourself so close to their minions to fight in it, because always think about this. What if an all-in happens? As a high elo player from mid and top lane, that should be your thought process going throughout laning phase. That's the reoccurring question. If an all-in happens between the two of us right now, who wins it? If an all-in happens right now in this position, who wins it? Because that's what's happening in high elo. They would choose this position to fight because they know about the minions. They would know that the minion aggro would be in Riven's favor, and this is where Riven would fight you. And okay, um, so in this sort of place, yeah. would you recommend that I just leave the minions and don't uh, melee attack them then? Because uh, obviously I, there's quite a long cooldown at the beginning on parlay. Right. It, this is this, this, in this situation, I would position myself on the opposite side that Riven's on and okay. towards your minions. So instead of being like on the left side where Riven is, you don't want, you'd want to be on the right side, closer to your minions, and last hit the minions that your minions are focusing, you, uh, like, focusing on. Your minions aren't worried, you know, your minions aren't focusing the range caster minions right now. You're not going to lose these last hits. But the minions are focusing their melee minions. So another thing you've got to do is think about where your minions are focusing their damage. There's no like stray minions here like going for the range caster minions. Like you don't have to worry about these minions so far. You just got to worry about the minions that your minions are focusing on. Those are the minions that become like lost minions if you're not worried about that. So like this melee minion and like positioning towards the right side would be the correct play right here. Um, but also the other aspect of this is like you can do what you just did is like put down your barrel and then like cue it just to push the lane in really fast. Um, something else we didn't talk about is the jungle matchup. And this is something else that all high elo players think about when you're playing mid and top, is exactly how much pressure their jungler can apply from the early game, mid game, or late game. So looking at it like this, um, I'll give you two scenarios. So let's say you're playing Gangplank versus Riven like you are right now, but you're against the current Nautilus matchup 
or let's do a hypothetical one, you're against a Warwick. And I always use Warwick because he's got one of the worst early games of any jungler. And I compare the two, like the pressure of what is currently there to what isn't there from Warwick, and like try to explain the differences of how you should react to the lane. So for instance, Nautilus, like I, wa I want you to, to answer this. How much pressure early game does Nautilus have? Like how afraid of Nautilus are you? I feel like uh, he brings quite a lot because obviously he can hook you in and he's got his auto attack to stun you. So right. I feel like he can bring a lot to an early gank. Absolutely, you're right. G Nautilus is like an absolute early game pressuring champion. Like he has multiple sources of crowd control. He's got a gap closing ability with his hook. He he's a danger. Like Nautilus is going to be looking to prioritize ganks over farming most of the time. Now that's not always true, but that's most of the time true. Now let me tell you, what if instead of having Nautilus game, they had a Warwick? How afraid of Warwick are you early game? Uh, not at all. You can't really gank much until level 6 at all. Right. So when you're jungling, always think about it like that. How you start controlling the lane early on comes down to the jungle pressure and the matchup you're against. Um, you also want to factor in your jungler, like how strong Scion is. Um, Scion's pretty strong early game. Like He's not Nautilus level of crowd control. He doesn't have a gap closer until he's 6. But he's got a little bit of CC with the charge Q, but not the same pressure. So... The reason why I brought that up is because a champion like Gangplank top lane can like pin the enemy champion under the turret. Like one way you can win this matchup as Gangplank versus Riven is if you just consistently push her to her turret and poke her down using your barrels and zoning tools and parlay in between her shields. That's one way you can win this lane. Another way you can win this lane is by controlling the minion wave and zoning her. So right now what's happening, and like this is why coaching can be so beneficial, because there's so many little snapshots like this. I mean, it's only been the three-minute mark, and there are like a ho whole host of information that can be gleaned from this. The way the, the minion wave is stacking is favorable for you if you want the minion wave to push towards your turret. So in other words, the, she's got more minions than you. If this was left untouched, it would push to your tower. And as a top laner, this is important to understand, because lane control is how you win top. L lane manipulation is how you win top lane. If you are strong enough to kill your lane opponent, but you're always pushing them to their tower, you might not be strong enough to dive them under the turret. Whereas if you control the minion wave and keep it closer to your side, you have more distance to run them down and kill them in. Okay, so with Gangplank, which one would you say is the better option for the early game? Depends on the jungle pressure. So you want to keep both of those ideas in mind. Like You can freeze it, zone them with your barrels, and just try to keep it closer to your side. Now that's beneficial because you have more distance to run them down and kill them. And also, it sets up ganks from your jungler. Junglers in Platinum and, and you know any ELO will always look for overextended laners first when they're going for ganks. Now you can ask for help if you're, if you're like pushed to their tower um, and you're wanting to dive the person, but your jungler is more than likely to gravitate towards the lanes that uh, your opponents are overextended in. And so you can create that opportunity. In this situation, if you don't AoE down the minions and you just steadily last hit at the last moment, it's going to push towards your side. Then Riven might panic and like not want to come up to the minions, losing more, more and more last hits, or you set up a gank on her. So going back to your original question, like what do you do on Gangplank, depends on the jungle pressure. So since you're against the Nautilus, who started on blue side, you also want to have an idea of where their jungler started. And in higher elo, it's easier to figure that out based on their top laner. So if their top laner, um, if you like get early wards down, trinket wards down, and you see that they're double jungling, um, you can kind of figure out which side they're going to be on. Because if they're double jungling, that usually means their bottom lane did a jungle camp. But in this case, their top laner didn't do a jungle camp. She was in lane right away. That should signal to you that she didn't leash. Um, and their jungler started on the side that their bottom lane's on. And this is like a lot of information. I'm sorry for throwing it all out there at once. But, um, you know, this is going to be, this is, this will be recorded if you want to see the recording afterwards. That's perfectly fine because this is a lot of information. Yeah, I'll definitely have to get over it again. <laughs> no problem. So, what's going to happen is like since if you had predicted or, or known that because Riven didn't leash and she didn't like double jungle or do a camp or anything like that, the enemy Nautilus is, you know, started blue side will be red side by about the three minute mark if you know which side the enemy jungler started on you'll know what side they end up on so if they started on blue side got a leash from their bottom lane they're going to end up getting red and being top side of the map 330 to four minute mark depending on how fast they're jungling and what camps they do so as a top laner like that was like a lot of information but 
as Gangplank, the, the right call here is to not push Riven to the turret because Nautilus is a high pressure early ganking jungler. Started on blue side, and the lane was already pushing towards you. Oh, also something that's really important. Um, I didn't even bring this up. Let's like go ahead and match, drag that up there so that they're on the same uh, tiers. Is that Riven does have Ignite. And this is something that uh, I didn't even think to check because it's so common for top laners to take teleport nowadays. But this is another big red flag. Um, if you have teleport and they have ignite, that's more of a reason for you to not want to play too aggressive and go for kills on them, but go for out trading and go for lane manipulation. So because you have teleport, you can like obviously, if something bad happens, and a bad trade happens, you can just go back and teleport back to top lane, and they can't if they have Ignite. Whereas they have the Ignite, so in a really heated all-in from like 100 to 0 or something like that for both of you, she'll have the tipping point with her Ignite. So you're more than likely against top laners with Ignite. You want them to overextend because they shouldn't feel safe overextending. So that's more of a reason why you should try to let it push, and you're sort of doing. But a little bit of AoE happened, so now it's starting to push towards her side. And, um, so yeah, does that make sense? Like, when a yeah, top laner has Ignite, you want them to overextend because they'll feel less safe. More jungle pressure from your jungler will happen topside. And because the top laner doesn't have teleport, it takes them so long to come back top. But one of the reasons why teleport came back into flavor after being gone for so long is because the top lane meta changed. Top lane nowadays, if you receive jungle pressure like that really heavily... Um, early early game and you don't have a lot of potions you just have to like you would have to go back and teleport back top but the way the meta has evolved because uh, top winners get a jungle camp now and just come back to lane with max potions if they get ganked by a jungler and they survive it they'll be able to potion back up and get the full health but the reason why ignite's so risky is because you don't have that teleport you can't double jungle you can't do a jungle camp and you can't really survive a jungle gank and come back to lane quickly enough to like have an advantage in lane. Uh, Broken Record, thanks for the sub. Get some Valkyrie teams in chat for our new subscriber, Broken Record. So those are like the big three things. You can't double jungle, you can't do a jungle camp yourself, and if you receive jungle pressure as a top laner without teleport, you can't stand up to it. Like you'll just have to go back and you'll get too far behind. So yeah. as you can see, there's a lot of pros to taking teleport right now. Yeah, another one that I wanted to ask with teleport, because um, I've only just recently swapped the top lane is is it just worth early game keeping it to go back to top lane or is it sometimes worth using it aggressively to go to another lane and saving it and walking back to lane? Most of the time you want to save your teleport to walk back to lane with. Like It's kind of a luxury to use it to come back top and it should be used very sparingly because if the, if the enemy team knows that your teleport's on cooldown and higher levels of play, which is you're aspiring to do, like right now you're in platinum, you have your sights set on diamond. Once you get to like diamond and master tier and stuff like that, the, the enemy team should have your teleport timered. Like, they'll know. Like, the enemy top laner will be like, alright guys, this guy used teleport. And what that'll trigger for other aspects of the map is, like, their bottom lane, if they know your teleport's down, they'll play more aggressive. And, and that's just how it goes. Phone microwave, thanks for the host, buddy. And if you don't have that pressure on the map, then you're always risking the aspect that your bottom lane will get all end. Now, in Platinum, that's, that's less likely. But we always want to aspire to, you know, like, if you play like a high elo player with that mentality, you'll eventually become a high elo player, and, like, you'll fit right in. So even though you're only in Platinum in your team, and the enemy team is probably not thinking about that, you still want to have that teleport up for the pressure. So use teleport back to top lane, mainly when you get pushed out of lane really aggressively by either the enemy jungler pressuring, or, say, the Riven all end you and had Ignite and try to push you out of lane, then you would still want to teleport back top lane. Um, so... If you, if it's if it's a you know a very casual recall like you both go back you wouldn't want to teleport back top lane you would save your teleport for if something aggressive happens to you top lane and you want to get back top without losing anything um, or you got ganked top lane you want to yeah, come right so, back top so if my minions are pushed to their turret it's not worth then right teleporting back because you'll have the time to walk back and absolutely like, and, and you want to have push. that teleport to make plays bottom side okay okay cool so in this play this is getting kind of hectic. Um, she's fighting you in your minions. So this is really tricky. Even though she has Ignite, if 
she started this duel like directly in your range caster minions in the cannon minion, you could beat her here because the cannon minion does 41 damage, three range caster minions, three times 24, um, like 72 damage right there. So there's more than 100 damage from these four minions happening every rotation of their auto attacks. She only has, you know, 300 health. So does that make sense? Like, these four minions can, like, solo kill her right now. That's okay, how yes. that's how so important these cannons are. Be doing that. Yes, very risky. But what you want to do is make sure you're fighting her directly in the minions. Top lane only, please. Thanks for the sub, my friends. I appreciate that. Get some Valkyrie teams in chat for top lane only, please. So, yeah, like, as you can see, she's, you know, three rotations of your minions hitting her. She's going to die. So she could lose this, but the only thing that could backfire is, like, if you don't react to it in time. And, like, you sort of reacted to it there, and she just backed out, which is a smart thing for her to do. If she continued to fight you there, like, it was that moment when she used her shield to get away after the auto that your cannon minion turned its aggro to her. But if that were to happen again, you would, you need to fight her directly in the minions. As close to your range caster minions and melee minions as possible, because you want to have your minions react as soon as possible. Um, and there's still a turn speed to the cannon minion and stuff like that, but we won't get into that. Okay. Nice, good trade. And yeah, right there, yeah, like she can't to continue to fight you there. Because of the shield, mm -hmm. because I got good damage on with the barrel, and then right. I was thinking straight away, because it gives uh, me the refresh of my passive, I can get in and get the damage and get it really low, but then the shield just kind of turned the trade more or less even right so you want to uh you still like after her shield you still want to trade with her so when she was walking away like that you kind of have to have an idea of the cooldowns on riven's abilities so for instance um if she uses like her q and w to trade on you she can't do that all the time like both her, her w and her e early game until she has high cdr is about 10 seconds so her trades are going to be about every 10 seconds so after she does a trade like that onto you, you can still trade onto her. Like, your parlay has, like, less than a five-second cooldown. So you can almost get two parlays in before her shield comes back up. So if she shields like that to block your parlay and starts to run, you could still get some parlays off on her. So you don't want to just, like, trade only on her terms, which is what you've been doing so far. After she trades on her terms, you want to trade on your terms as well. Uh, Big Daddy Kane, I would suggest him to to even fight that Riven with considering her stun. A higher elo Riven wouldn't lose that fight, especially with Ignite. That's true, but at the same time, you also have to factor in um, the minion damage, which is the big thing. And that last all-in, I don't think Riven would have won it. It would have been, if anything, it would have been a kill trade, and then, like, the Gangplank has teleport. So at the very worst in that previous little skirmish, when he had three range caster minions and a cannon, at the very worst, it would have been a kill trade. And... At the very best, it would have been Gangplank getting the kill. And the kill trade goes in favor of the person with the teleport. But you're right. You want to avoid the all-ins if you can, if they have the Ignite. Because it's really hard to measure, you know, exactly how much damage you have, like, as Gangplank versus a Riven, but with plus Ignite. Like, it's already kind of hard to measure at certain points, like, if you can beat the Riven. But the Ignite's the tipping point. But what you want to do right now is, since the wave is going to push towards her turret, you don't want to fight her anymore. You just want to go back. So after these minions go down, you just go back. So right now, you would recall and just teleport back top. And this might be kind of risky, but this is like... Uh, the reason why I would say to do this is so that you can go buy a ward and pressure her even harder under the tower. So right now, she's like very, very low. You can recall, like go back. Let's see how much gold you have. You have 500 gold. You could get a Doran's Blade, a Green Ward, and some potions. Either teleport to your turret, or in this case, you could teleport directly to one of these minions and continue pressuring under the turret. But, like, you're in a prime position that because she doesn't have teleport, you can, like, poke her low under the tower or kill her under the tower. And, like, if she goes back, she's going to miss, like, two minion waves. Because, like, your minions are already under the tower. And, like, if you poke her off the turret, she's not able to even get close to it. The next minion wave will also dump under the tower, and she'll miss that, too. So, in this situation, that's what I would have done. It's kind of risky for you to stay here and, like, pressure under the turret without either going to Trinket Ward. But, um... In this case, that's what I would have done, is either just go back right away and teleport either to these minions or to the turret, and then just, like, try to continue pressuring her, because her not having that teleport is, you know, a really a really bad thing for her. But remember, you know, Nautilus is still topside, so that's the other the 
The other big thing you got to be thinking about is when that pressure will come to you. Excellent damage on her. Shield didn't block all of it. And then you yeah, want to get range and parlay something. her. So, like, yeah, like, you know her shield. You know now that her shield has about a 10-second cooldown. So you'd want to be getting in range to Q her again. After every shield she does, you want to get at least an extra parlay on her after the shield. Okay. So yeah, right there, you'd want to walk I wasn't, up and her. I wasn't yeah. really thinking about was the Nautilus, um, because I didn't really consider he's a really early game jungler. Right. So, and he's, he's coming in right here. Top lane only, please, $20. I love helping people, and I just wanted to donate. Smiley face, good luck. Top lane only, please. Dude, thank you. I appreciate that top lane only. Awesome, man. And yeah, r what's happening right here is the Nautilus is coming to gank. I mean, if this is a Warwick, you would just walk away from it. But because it's the high pressure, the Nautilus is considered a high pressure early gank ganking jungler, so you have yourself in that category, you have Nidalee, you have Elise, you have Lee Sin, you have Jarvan. There are a lot of junglers that have that early game pressure, and there are also junglers like Shivana and Master Yi and stuff like that that aren't considered that high pressure. So yeah, like if you feel unsafe top lane, you need to either go trinket ward or you need to go back. Like as a top laner, like that's why lane manipulation is so important because if you feel unsafe, you're kind of rolling the dice. Like you you like you have to know where the enemy jungler is if you're pushed to their tower or you have to have a ward out so you can back off in time. So if you push to the you know, like in some situations what just happened, like if Nautilus didn't come top, I bet you would have probably killed Riven. Like, you would eventually would have killed Riven, because she probably would have gotten greedy and would have stayed, and you would have continued to poke her. But because you took the risk, and you gambled, and you didn't have a word out, and Nautilus was just topside after, um, you know, clearing through blue to red, you have to blow your flash. And that was good that you got Riven's flash, too. Honestly, Riven should have not burned flash there, but you definitely needed to burn flash. So that, that was, like, good, like, unless you dodged the hook. Um, it's just kind of risky, because... Like, you never know what'll end up happening. Like, you get changed CC, then Riven might flash on you, ignite you, stun you, you might die. But Riven burning flash there was really good for you, and now their jungler has shown himself topside. And now you should feel a little bit safer. But the first thing you gotta do, when you spot their jungler, like, leave the top lane, to make sure the jungler's not backtracking around, you wanna go ward. Like, the best place to ward right now would be in the tri bush, because Nautilus wouldn't have enough time to go all the way around. Um, when your blue side top lane, You'll see some top laners ward in the tri bush because the junglers will come through there. But you also see sometimes top laners will ward like in this area as a blue side top laner, which your blue side, um, and that will also, you know, that's like a very like well-rounded ward to put it right here because you'll see when they're coming through the tri bush to come in behind you. But you also see when they come through the river. But because you knew exactly where Nautilus was, you want to like go in and put the trinket ward as soon as possible so that you can continue to pressure Riven and like follow Nautilus's movements because Riven needs to go back like. She, the only way like she's getting out of this without getting too far behind is if this Nautilus had just like stayed with her top and shoved it to your turret. That's what would have happened in high elo in this situation. Would be like the jungler would have just simply stayed in lane and just tried to help Riven push it to the tower so she could go back. So the way you outplay that is by like either wasting Nautilus's time by like putting the ward down here and just backing off whenever Nautilus backs out, or just go back yourself and uh, and just you know play it really safe. And then come back to lane and just try to shove uh, the Riven out when you have a longer duration ward or pink ward. Good dodge. And wasting a bit of that guy's time. And yeah, Nautilus is probably going to help shove now, right? Maybe not. It's getting it's getting just really risky, though. Ooh, that was almost. It's getting really risky because like, you're trying to 2v1 them and you're missing a lot of health and mana. And you have 700 gold. Like, that's not enough to get a phage or anything like that, but this is just kind of what happens top lane. Ooh, risky. She's going for it. Kill trade. Yeah, kill trade. So yeah, like, stayed around a little bit too long. Abuse your teleport versus a ignite user. Like, if you get this low, you can get back to top lane just like that. Just in a snap. Um... Yeah, I did feel at that point that the Nautilus was going to go and leave. I didn't realize that uh, he, he was going to stay away because he walked away and then yeah. came straight back. He'd just gone out of the minion range, so um, I didn't expect him to come straight back. Well, I mean, but that's just that's just what junglers do. Um, yeah. it, they, they know that you think that, or they should at least, and that's why they come right back immediately. So until, like, further... In, in high elo, like, the, the rule of thumb is until further notice after a jungler shows their face in one lane... 
Until further notice, they're still in that lane. You always have to treat it like they're still in that lane. Okay. I've had cases where I'll play top or mid or something, I'm getting camped. Like, their Lee Sin or something will show themselves mid, and like for the next minute, he'll like progressively like come back around and try to gank me over and over again. Because some players are like, okay, the jungler was just here, he's gone, I can go aggressive now. But oftentimes, junglers like find a lot of free kills because they're like, okay, as soon as I leave, they're going to go aggressive again thinking I'm gone. So always treat it like they're still topside until, you know, otherwise said, if they had shown themselves top lane. Yeah, so with that, where would you have warded at that point? Because obviously, if, if, if I you, went into the yeah. tri brush, it would have been quite risky because he could have just looped straight back through as he did. That's why River, That's why you do it when he's like, well. it, it's about the timing window, but you're right. It's a timing window. I mean, we could go back um, and look at it, but let's just like, try to predict where it was. So basically there was a point where Nautilus is like right here where my cursor is and you are right around there. Okay. Um, I just know from experience that you have enough time to like walk over here and lob the trinket ward over at an angle so you don't have to get into the bush. And you should get into a habit of doing that. Rather than walking directly in the bush, if you walk right over here and position the cursor right there, it'll go into the bush. So rather than going all the way over here to throw it in the bush, you can put it like being at an angle here. And Nautilus also has to be like within line of sight like direct line of sight of you to hook you like he can't like hook you through this terrain right like he's got to like walk down and around and then hook you at a straight line you just had enough time like riven was too far away and it was just i know as a high elo player there's enough time for you to go and do that but like if you don't feel comfortable doing that i mean the other thing is just like you could walk down here and put the trinket word right there or in this bush just so you have that head heads up you know putting it right here would have been perfectly fine too but putting it there right away when you spot them as he's leaving is the best idea because if he does back, uh, if you can still pressure, and if he does loop around again, you see it right away and you can back up. Okay, sure thing. Yeah. I think in this game as well, I made um, a couple of risky sort of teleport plays. Um, and I'd like to go over them when they sort of come up. Sure. Because uh, I've been struggling with teleport sort of as being new to top lane because I used to play mid so I haven't really been used to that sort of oh, thing. Oh absolutely yeah no that's no problem man we'll be looking at those teleport plays because that's a big part of top lane is knowing when to teleport and keep this in mind too um, teleport you know just because you can teleport to a play across the map doesn't mean you should always do that some of the time like okay because this is very a unique situation where their top laner has ignite I don't know how common that is in your elo for their top laner to have ignite but in, in, like, Master Challenger, every game is going to be teleport versus teleport top lane. And once it's teleport versus teleport top lane, you get into situations where it's, like, because a play is happening elsewhere, like, say your teleport was up and, like, was up right now, like, you know, some top laners that are level 6 could, like, influence this. But also some top laners level 6 can influence this. Um, but as game plank, you have your ultimate and stuff like that. But, like, if you teleported into a play like this and it was going to be kind of close... Uh, so you're playing Malphite or something like that, and they all got close to your tower. Like, things can backfire with their teleport, too. But, like, the thing to keep in mind for teleport is, like, just because you can teleport to an all-in play that's happening across the map doesn't mean you should always do it. Because if you leave top lane with your teleport and you get nothing out of using that teleport elsewhere, and their top laner stays top, you've just indirectly, like, lost yourself, like, a couple minions, uh, or a couple minion waves. At least two. And that can end up, like, being a level difference or two level difference later in the game, it, like a couple of bad mistakes like that, and then that can be how you lose top lane. And Riven is like tanking the minions in front of the tower. She should feel confident just last in under the tower. Oh, she, yeah, she's going to go for the all-in here. And when you're playing Gangplank, uh, make sure you position the ultimate either directly so you're in the center of it if they're going to all-in you like this or where the Riven's going to be. But I wouldn't all-in Riven. Like, I haven't played enough Gangplank to honestly know his burst exactly with Sheen. And, like, even, you know, the barrels are 50% armor, shred, and whatnot. But typically speaking, the Gangplank versus Riven matchup, you still want to look to outpoke her. Like, because you have the advantage of being ranged and she can't really deal with that other than getting directly on top of you, you want to abuse that. So in this situation... Rather than turning and all inning her, you would like, you'd probably want to just outpoke her. Like she, she ends up. Oh my god, you you basically killed her there. But she ends up like panicking and not fighting you there. Oh my god, did you kill her? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, kudos to you. Like I, I, I figured she was gonna go all into this, 
And it's kind of risky, even though she's missing health, because it's a Riven. Like, her burst is, is really high. She, like, ended up not hitting you at all and just running and you killed her. So, she's missing a decent amount of health. I guess she's missing about 200 health. But it's still a Riven, and you got to respect the ultimate pressure. Uh, right here, she should have just, like, ulted and gone on to you right away. But she just... This Riven player is not using Riven to the fullest extent. And she missed her stun. Oh, baby. Yeah, she missed her stun. She, she messed this up. Didn't pop her ult here. Starts running from you. And then, yeah, KO. She, she like, stays back around. Th this Riven doesn't really know what she's doing very much. But still well played from you. Um, capitalizing on these mistakes are also really important. Looking for those key cooldowns. She missed the stun. I don't know if you saw that. She missed the stun. She used her E ability really early into the trade. And she didn't ult. So there were three mistakes there from Riven. She missed the Oops. stun. Yeah. She used her shield really early in the trade, um, and she didn't even pop her ultimate, and she didn't even fight you. So <laughs> she she tried to all-in you, and then she started to run. But So from the other sort of side of that, if I was a Riven, right. would you have just gone straight in with the ult and just gone for the kill straight away on the gangplank? I probably would have. I mean, yeah. I don't play... Riven's not like my most played or anything like that, but she's got a Brutalizer. I mean, she's missing 200 health or so. Honestly, if she popped her ultimate really early... It, like, and you were still level 6, I don't know. Like, it, it might have been still pretty close since she was missing a bit of health, but it would have definitely been way closer than... Like, I don't think I would have chosen that all-in window, but then again, like, because she felt kind of confined with being pushed under the tower, like, that's kind of a window that she could have gone for. But you played it correctly if you, like, decided to go into that play because she used her shield and W early and didn't ult. But, you know, kind of kind of get a better grasp of the cooldowns being used there. I mean, we watched it pretty quickly and I was talking, but going back through it, like, if I was in that moment and I saw her miss the stun, I probably would have gone all, all in on most champions. Like, the stun is so core to her trades. It's like how she's able to, like, start getting um, the trades off on you first is because she'll, like, she'll, like, Q onto you, stun you, and then, like, get the third Q off. And by that time, you've been CC'd and she's gotten, like, a couple autos off and like all of her abilities and you're like half health and then the ult will almost be in range to kill you soon so it's kind of tricky but like as a top laner that's also a great idea to like you know keep an eye on is like the cooldowns that they're using like she just randomly like just used her e like i don't know if you just saw that but she just like used her e and then queued into the bush like this is also a window where you just like walk up and abuse her <laughs> if, if someone yeah. ever does that to you like you said you came from mid lane um Look at it like this. If you're playing against an Ari mid lane and she just like misses her orb of deception and charm, would you go on to her? Like Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. So same thing for top lane too. If you're against a, a champion top that has like very trade centric abilities like Riven does, if she just like randomly like dashes into the bush or something like that, it's like that's on cooldown. You're gonna get a great trade off on that, or that could be your all in window. I don't know what she's doing. But like Yeah, I think at this point I didn't really respect the fact that she still had her ult from the last trade. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of waiting, you could have gotten a, a parlay off on her. Um, like, when you're waiting around, like, her E was still on cooldown. So you probably could have gotten a parlay off while you guys were just dashing around and waited and got another parlay off before she came in here, or could have parlayed the barrel when she came in here. So... A little bit of mismanagement of your cooldowns, and it's going to be a bit closer because of that, and I think she'll get it. Yeah, she got it here. So, a little bit of mismanagement, but it's you still were in a position to maybe make this work. So right here, um, let's kind of slow it down so it's easier to follow. Uh, she uses her stun. Her her dash is, her E ability is still on cooldown. So instead of just waiting around like that, I guess, is your parlay on cooldown? It's kind of hard. There's a spectator bug. It's It shows itself not resetting, but I think your parlay was up. But like... Stay at max range with your parlay. You know, use your barrel as a zoning tool. Use your other barrel um, to poke her when she's dancing around like that. But don't walk into her. Like, that's the only moment you'll lose a lot of their trades as a ranged champion versus Riven. Say you're playing Teemo or Lulu or something like that. It's the same principle as if you let her get in range to start hitting you. You can always just sit back and, and poke her, you know? You can always choose to, to walk back. And if her, cool, if her Q and E are in cooldown, she doesn't have those gap closers. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, I was trying to... Uh, I hope she wouldn't all in me because I had that barrel around there. So yeah. I thought that might zone her, but obviously she still had her ult, so she could easily all in me. 
Where did you use your ult? I think it was bot lane. Another thing about using the ult there, wait until it hits the tower. Because it was about to drop mini Nagro, and you could have gotten a lot of these last hits. And it's okay that you did that. Like, Sona actually should have probably gotten dove here. Their bottom lane should have just, like, straight up just dove that Sona. So, like, using your old bottom is a good decision, but positioning it needed to be under the tower. Instead of, like, where the minion wave was, because your minions down there were about to die, the minion wave was about to move. Yeah, I think at that point I was just trying to zone uh, the champs away. I didn't think about uh, the minions. Another. Okay, let's skip a little bit ahead because right now, um, you know, the laning phase is, is still continuing like it was before. We've already talked about how it should be traded and stuff. Um, basically, you got to focus on out poking her rather than out all in her, up, you know, going for the all ins directly into her. And that's how Gangplank would beat Riven, is just looking to do the poking, parlay her directly when her shield is on cooldown, because the shield is about twice the cooldown of your parlay. So even after she parlays or she blocks your parlay like that, you can just Q her. Now that might change as the game progresses because the CDR is going to vary, but um, as a rule of thumb, early game, that's what the trade should look like. So let's skip ahead a little bit and look for your teleport place. Looks like Laney Phase ends up becoming a farm lane for the most part. And her ignites uh, back up. Yeah, I think she ended up being quite scared. Um. Good, you backed out there. See, you won that trade really hard. Like, she popped her ultimate, you didn't fight her directly in there, you just kited back and you poked her. Like, that's exactly what you got to be looking to do. Um, almost in every matchup, it's like that for Gangplank, not just Riven. Just, you got to focus on out poking them because Gangplank's so good at it. She baited out your all in just kind of like uh, you did to her. Yeah, so there, would it have been better to just keep my ult? Yes, it would have been better to, ke to keep your ult. If, if there's no way to guarantee that she'll fight you there, the only way you could guarantee she'll fight you there is if she wants to all in you. Like, I just backed off. I mean, it's kind of... Nice. You wait. I liked how you waited to use your parlay until uh, her shield went down. So that was really smart there. And you could kill this guy too. I don't, I don't know if how confident you are, but... With uh, with going for that trade, but Nautilus's damage is basically on cooldown. Um, yeah, at this stage yeah. I haven't played too many games with Gangplank, so I wasn't quite sure uh, of my damage output. And you just you I, just want to kite still him. Thought he yeah. still have the shield as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he just used everything in that trade. Like he used everything on the trade when he started to run. Like Nautilus is not very high damaging. We talked about how much pressure he has, but that's usually just with crowd control. He just doesn't have very much damage. So you could have kited him there and, and killed him as well. Um, a big thing is just testing your limits, seeing what you can do. And, like, that's how you kind of figure out a better grasp of what's possible. It's just testing what you can do. You're going back and you got a Trinity Force. Nice. So you are substantially stronger than... I uh, think this is a teleport play. Okay. Cool. Let me, let me go... Let me backtrack here. So you see them kind of pushed up. But when you start the teleport, they're not... Let's see... Okay, they are up in the tower. But one of the problems with this teleport play is that, unfortunately, there's nothing really stopping them from running away. So the teleport plays, what you need to typically look for is... Uh, and your team is also really not there, so you'll, you'll die. Tom Kench does a lot of damage. Is, like, teleporting into plays where they, they have no escape. So you teleport into the tribush, but nothing's really stopping them from just running away. Like, they can see the teleport in the Fog of War... 3.5 seconds is how long it takes. So I would not teleport into this play unless it was, say, like a word behind them. So it was a word in this bush or a word right there. That's the only way this this play would work. But also, it's kind of a risky play as well because Tom Kinch can just eat the Jace and they will just run away faster. So this is just, I wouldn't have teleported into this play. Yeah. Save your teleport for either going back top or for a better play. For sure. So just because your teleport's up doesn't mean you have to make plays elsewhere. Save it for the right place. Save it for the right place, because it's a big deal. It's a long cooldown, 
and it is also a very influential game changer. Now that your teleport's on cooldown, um, you can't make any plays on the bottom side of the map for a while, and Riven caught back up. Riven is able to, um, you know, she's she's getting pretty close to evening the CS after that, and she'll almost she almost took your tower, which uh, which would have given her even more gold. You're still higher level than her, and you're still a bit stronger, but the gap has closed a bit more. Does a teleport make sense though? Like you, as a as a champion like Gangplank, because you don't have great gap closers or like hard CC like a Malphite, it's it's a lot riskier to make a teleport play like that. And it needed to have been like directly behind them or like in an all-in situation. Yeah, at that point, I um, I know the uh, Triforce is a massive damage spike, so I thought I could go in, get the kill on the Tom Kench, and then hopefully get the Jace to run away. Yeah, but even then, even if you're able to kill the Tom Kench there. You're, you're leaving Riven to like catch back up top lane. So a lot of times it's just, you know, even if you're able to make a play like that, it's sometimes just not worth it because it, your lane opponent will catch back up. Um, risky all in there, like, gotta poke her down a bit more. From her current HP, you could make that same all in play. Like if you had your ult right now, you could kill her into the tower uh, if you hit a barrel on her plus the ult and then finish with like uh, an auto or key or something. So yeah, like, just because you, eat, like, even if you were able to make the kill happen on the Tom Kench, like, letting Riven catch back up top lane would have been a mistake. So you want to wait for, like, a play that would be, like, a guaranteed double kill and maybe Dragon. You got a kill there. Nice. So you're still able to still kill her and pressure her, but you want to, like, as a top laner, you want to look to, like, usually take the turret and, like, make their top laner uh, close to useless when you have an advantage like you do before, like, really looking to make plays elsewhere if you can. I mean, your team is a little bit behind bottom side, and eh, they're pretty far behind. But like, you gotta wait for that moment where their bottom lane is over committing for the teleport play to work. Yeah, so, um, if the enemy top laner had TP and they had gone down, would you still would you follow them at that point? Or yeah, it, okay. Say yeah. in that situation, the Riven started the teleport, and then they like started the dive or something like that, or started to fight someone, and you're able to teleport behind them. Then yes, go for it. But like, if you leave top and your top lane opponent stays top, like you'll get behind unless something crazy happens, like your team gets dragon as a result of it, or you get like a tower down there or a bunch of kills. It's just most of the time not worth it, unless you can. It's very, very pre a predictable kill. I think it's better to stay topside. Okay. Yeah, I think this ended up just uh, farming for quite a while at this point. Yeah. So right here, like. Oh, at this yeah. point, I was watching what I was doing with my ult, and I wasn't yeah. watching what I was doing. Well, let me let me go back real quick. That, that's there. okay. But like, uh, at this point, you definitely do want to be grouping with your team. But going through their jungle is also a really risky point. Um, you ulted there; they're diving and stuff like that. If it was just Nautilus, you're definitely gonna kill that. But because it's Nautilus plus Jace, and they just kind of end up kiting you, ends up being a little bit iffy. Jenkins, thanks for $10, buddy. Zero message. Thanks, Jenkins. But yeah, it was smart for you to roam down there, but just risky through their jungle without vision there. And uh, that, that was also a really, that would have been a really good time for teleport since they were diving under your tower, you know, teleporting there. You wouldn't miss too much top side since you've taken their tower and it was already pushed really close to the other side of the map. You have more time to get there. But, um, Mistake there was just walking through their jungle without vision, and then just all in the first person you saw. Because you know when Nautilus, when when Nautilus ended up fighting you, you also could have backed away from that situation. You know. Okay, so you're yeah. teleporting top now. I mean, I think it's good that you teleported here, but like you don't want to be on the back foot like this. Like if everything played out to what it currently is, it's okay for you to teleport here to save the tower and get that huge minion wave. But you also don't want to be in that position, as well. Um, where you have to use your teleport to save that tower because you still have so much control over Riven. Leaving lane like that gave her some more breathing room. So, still a pretty pretty big experience lead. Magic Slab, thanks for five months in a row, buddy. Get some Valkyrie teams in chat for Magic Slab. Four hundred forty, nice. 
See, like you do that a couple more times, and she's just she's just gonzo. All right, let's talk about upgrading your trinket word. So top lane, almost every game top, when you hit level nine, you want to stick with the wording totem, but upgrade it to um, the mini sight stone. So you don't want to upgrade it to you don't want to upgrade it to the greater vision totem, but you upgrade it to the other one, the one that's like the mini sight stone, where it's just like wording totem but better. You want to do that as soon as you're level nine, so you're able to. Not only have a word in their tri bush, but a word in the river, and just you have like really good vision, and uh, you should be able to catch her here. Yeah, I think I end up having to blow flash to catch. Yeah, him. Scion was, Scion like was in the river and could have, uh, could have gone back up there. So make sure you're pinging as well. Scion could have just like caught her right there. And yeah, grouping with your team now. Your team wants to kind of force a fight while Riven's dead. But nothing's really uh, too firmly established. Also, Tom, uh, one of the best ways to win solo queue, and as you're climbing the ladder, at least up until Master Tier or High Diamond, is to focus on laning phase. So, like, I think your primary thing that you want to do right now, rather than getting too technical with the teleport plays and stuff, I would say your main, the main way that you should. Uh, try to carry yourself throughout solo queue is to, as Gangplank top laner, as a top laner, right now just focus on beating your lane opponent and establishing dominance, and like trying to save your teleport for the big influential plays. Um, so don't like just leave top because your teleport's up. Because, you know, right now you can just keep smashing this Riven. Like, you can smash this Riven all the way to the tier 2 turret. And if you do that fast enough and early enough, like, it can start bringing everyone on the enemy team topside. Well, not everyone, but draw a lot of attention topside and alleviate pressure elsewhere in the map. So as a top laner, like, you don't have to always go elsewhere to pressure to be a threat. Sometimes you can pressure top so hard that the threat comes, the threat has to come to you. Okay, at, at this point, was it all right to roam down because they're all yeah. down here? Oh, absolutely. Continued split pushing. If, you're, if your teleport was up, which it shows it not being up, it would be fine for you to continue pushing up here. Um, and that's like the benefit of having teleport mid to late game, like past 20 minutes or so. You could, like, Riven can't stand up to you 1v1. So you just, you want to stay split and keep beating her. And then if something crazy happens, you can teleport to it and Riven's stuck top. And, uh, you know, they, they tried to fight you guys here and you're huge. And you carried this fight really, really hard. So that's nice. And afterwards, you and your team need to get a tower or two. Three of them are dead. Um, kind of tricky. Someone needs to, like, kill this Syndra. She's out of position a little bit. Uh, I guess going top for you is okay too, because then uh, you can spread them thin, and also you got a big wave here. But in high relo, I would have like called for Scion to probably dive that with his ult, since Syndra was so so far out, and then you guys just take that tower. But um, yeah, I suppose without Syndra, then there's no one really to do anything. Yeah, that's Jace. Yeah. Uh, Jace had to back, so he couldn't have done anything. I like how you put the barrel here, but make sure it's in the bush so they can't see it yeah. directly. But like when they run out or run at you like this, you could just connect it, and then, and then queue like that. You queued there for the movement speed from your passive. That's okay. But um, you still want to like if you can while you're running away like that, you still want to kind of poke them. So like as you had the barrel in the bush, you'd want to connect it and then like you know get the passive proc, but also hit Tom Kench. That's a way you can kill people that are chasing you as gangplank. It's just like kind of position it so you're still like able to run in a straight line away but like cue the barrel as they're like running at you it's kind of weird to say without seeing it but if that makes sense good connector yeah i wasn't quite oh, sure what the range was on it so i didn't know whether we could do it well you did uh, well, well um yeah you got it no that was great and you got your teleport up i think like it still says it on it's on cooldown let's see i guess the spectator mode just broke but Still a decent enough ult. Also, did you upgrade your? Uh, I didn't see. Did you upgrade your serpent or your uh, your ultimate with the serpent, silver serpents? Yeah, I upgraded it to the uh, fire at will. That one's okay. I think um, the true damage one and the initial slow one is the best one for the early game. Do you know? Do you know which one I'm talking about? I don't know the name uh, of it. Yeah, it's the death's daughter. Death's daughter. Yeah. I've seen a lot of gangplanks in high low get that one early game, but I'm actually not too familiar with the best one is to get right now for Gangplank. But you are slapping people. Nice, man. You have like yeah. a ton of gold, I bet. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have 4,000 gold. 
need, need to go use that gold uh, a little bit earlier because you would have infinity edge for these these fights and they'd be a lot smoother. Um, it can sometimes get hard with ha with you dominating so much. Like you can still make these plays without going back, but four thousand gold is a bit too much. I would say going back with two thousand gold is still kind of pushing it. You still want to recall in increments and still buy like pieces to things, so you're able to also buy words in addition to that and upgrade your trinket word and stuff like that. Because if you're out without vision, then it's just you you can just make a mistake and, and bad things will happen, you know. So yeah, I think I was just focused because the team were always fighting, so I was trying to stay around for that and didn't really want to back while they were still trying to fight. That that's why you tell your team back your strongest person, me, needs to go by. You gotta you gotta communicate a little bit more because okay. uh, that's you know that's a that's a mentality a mistake mentality that can be easily remedied with this you know communication. Like there will be there still will be games where people tunnel really really hard. Um, preempt you know you ulted kind of early there before the fight was committed. You want to wait to use your ultimate until uh, the, like the the area of the fight is committed. So like right here, like this is the area is committed. Like it's all on top of your team right here. You're still gonna win this fight really hard. Um, but I mean, you got like 4.5k gold. That's almost half your total gold right there. I mean, it's great that your team is still able to win this, but just imagine if you had your Infinity Edge right now, plus yeah, like. Killed them more all. damage, yeah. It would have been that would have been like the end of the game. Your team would have like killed him there, Baron. Uh, while that was happening, Riven was pushing top. So, not the best fight for you guys to kind of force as well, since Riven was in position to uh, push the tower in top side. You would want to like control the waves and then like you know, I mean, because Riven's overextended like that, you should look at it like, hey, Riven's free kill. Plus, I need to go defend there. Let me go push out team. Go spend my gold. Your massive quantities of gold, man. You can get like a last whisper here if you wanted to, but you could also get uh, work towards like Phantom Dancer or something. Yeah, that's what you're doing. So cool. Yeah, do you reckon um, Phantom Dancer or Static Shiv is better on the new Gangplank? I uh, I think Static Shiv has, a, you know, Static Shiv is still pretty good, but I think there are other. Just getting like raw physical damage is also really nice. Like in Trinity Force and Infinity Edge. I've seen some Gangplanks, like, the highest damage build with Gangplank is just getting more than one Infinity Edge, which is weird, but, like, because it's the, it's, like, the only item with, with how much damage and crit on it, that it ends up being, like, you know, the passive it on it doesn't stack, but, like, it just gives so much attack damage and crit chance that, like, the highest damaging Gangplank build has Infinity Edge, more than one Infinity Edge in it. So would you only really do that sort of build if you were already well ahead? Yeah, I mean, a build like that is it, it's it's not great until the super late game. Um, but right here, I want to talk about this team fight really quickly. I mean, you came into it, but remember, Gangplank, kind of like laning phase, you don't always just want to zerg into them. Um, you still want to abuse your range. Like, very rarely is it going to be safe for you to start auto-attacking people in a team fight. In this situation, when you see the... Uh, the ribbon coming at you and the the Tomkin's still here. You don't want to be stuck in a situation where um, like you're just trading auto attacks with the ribbon unless she's already chunked, which is what happens. Like you end up walking into her. Um, you got the Q off on them, pretty nice, but the shield blocked a lot of it. And then you're trading autos with uh, with a ribbon, and she's gonna win that trade. Like that's yeah. ribbon just has more damage in that situation than you would like to deal with. But because you have the range to parlay in the barrels, you just abuse that. So team fights, Gangplank and high elo and whatnot, you'll see them kind of do what you did at the very end of this fight. They're hanging back. They only go into auto attack when it's pretty much decided. Like you're just going in to finish them. You just parlay them, you barrel them, and then like kite them back and forth and then like end up using your autos as like the execution. So even with that, when uh, my team is getting engaged on, I shouldn't have uh, gone. You should go into the in. fight, yeah. but not go into like physically auto attack, because yeah. you know you're you're really far ahead, but not far ahead enough to like still trade autos with a ribbon and a jace and stuff like that. They're, it's just their kits are all centered about like you know kind of fighting you when in the up close and personal quarters, but you don't have to do that. That's the benefit of gangplank, and why he's kind of ridiculous is uh, his AOE damage. 
and, and the luxury of being at ranged and having a global ultimate, he's just he's a monster. If you if you really abuse his range, it's really hard to, to kill the gangplank. And he still can contribute a lot to the fight, setting down barrels and queuing them. Or just queuing them directly if they're kiting you. So that's something I need to work on more is uh, kiting them with the barrels when I'm running away and not just using them for movement speed. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so you're teleporting top right here. In like, instead of doing that, you would probably want to wait until it got even further. Like, this wave is going to definitely push through their inhibitor. So once it got further down there and the enemy team is, like, not going to deal with it, you could teleport directly to their inhibitor and then take it. Or you could, like, come down here and fight and then, like, eventually make your, your way to a side lane and then just have your teleport up. So using your teleport like that gave the enemy team a lot of time to react to it. They didn't react to it, and it's only going to be Riven to defend for now. Um, which, if you play it correctly, you know, you can beat Riven 1v1, so it could still be good, but you don't want to, like, teleport that far ahead of time, because they've had so much time to react to you. So would I maybe want to wait for them to commit to the fight as well? Yeah. Wait to, yeah. wait for them to commit to the fight, or just wait to see what they do, because it's, 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 it's up to them to make the play. At that point, your team had such a big mini wave pushing, like, if they don't go to deal with that, that's also going to pressure their tower. Um, but they're more likely to go deal with that when, oof, very close. Yeah. It was very, very, very close. close. As like you can you tell, you it's just, yeah. don't want to be yeah. trading auto attacks. Yeah. Again. Definitely not. Just kite back, parlay, barrel when you can. You know, you can still run them down and kill them. Abuse your passive maybe once or so um, in a trade like that and continue to kite back. Because you have so much movement speed on Gangplank when you proc it. <laughs> Plus, you can kite through the slow in your ultimate and stuff. There's just a lot of perks to kiting on Gangplank. It's... Can you also use him for sieging as well? Yes. Uh, obviously because of the range, yeah. Yes, he's Gangplank is a monster in sieges. If you, uh, in this situation, because you were stronger than Riven, you could win the game by just split pushing and just killing her. And if they send more than one person to deal with you, then you go teleport to the team. But you're also so strong in team fights. So that's good that you have options on Gangplank. Is that like you can split push to win or you could just team fight with your team and win. And that's just what your team is doing. You killed two of them so far, and one of your teammates are dead. But after a team after a team fight like that, you kind of want your team to take an objective, like Dragon or Baron or uh, a tower. Your team really wasn't in position to do that, but you want to be in position to do that. So you want to start fighting more on your terms as the, the game progresses. So like instead of just fighting the enemy team because they're pushing down mid, you and your team go clear out Baron and you know force them to come to you. So that if you win a team fight there, you're already in position to do Baron with your team. And like it's just it's very clean. Whereas if it's the fight's all ragtagged and like random and around mid, it's a lot harder to chain together an objective afterwards because you know your team might need to be communicated what needs to happen. And there's a lot of downtime. Oh yeah, they're all coming top. Yeah. I'm oh yeah. A mistake here going up in that <laughs> that's the, that's the other thing. What I what I told you earlier is make sure you upgrade your trinket ward at level nine um, for the warding totem. So it's a mini sight stone. So late game split pushing, even if your support doesn't ward for you, you can ward for yourself and you have more than one out. Even if you don't have inventory space, there's always your trinket. So as well being top laner, would you, if you've got space, would you go for a pink ward as well as the uh, trinket totem? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Especially when you have control of top lane. If you're specifically winning top, buying a pink ward's even better because their top laner shouldn't feel comfortable going to kill the pink. And like it's just going to be a perma ward there, and their jungler will eventually have to come kill it, or you'll lose it because you recalled or teleported elsewhere. But like it's totally worth it, definitely. Like winning top lane is more of a reason for you to buy a pink ward than losing, but like it's still important to do it in both situations because you can deny their ward if you saw where they warded, you plop down their your pink there. They should feel pretty unsafe because you're like you denied their ward, like they don't have vision anymore, and you know exactly which root doesn't have vision, so your your jungler can come and gank through where that pink ward is. Oh, that, that poke is great. I like that ult there, though. That was a really good ult. And bam! Oh, man. Nice damage. W away. Yeah, I know here I wasn't really Ooh. paying attention to the items because... Um, Ooh. No, that was look, great. That was when great. I look back on it, uh, Nautilus has a Thorn Mail, so it's pretty risky to keep fighting him. Your team is also, like, not helping you here. They mm. should Instead of chasing, they should have been where you are. But also, back out a little bit sooner. You're cutting it. You're cutting it pretty close <laughs> with HP. 
but still very well played. No, that was the moment where you trade autos with him. That was like, if there's ever a moment to talk about when the trade autos is gangplank on a ribbon, it was right here. You played it wonderfully. So you carry this fight so hard. The Q onto Syndra, you ult, you force the flash out of her. It was a great ult. And the next Q kills her. And then your ultimate was still like hitting the tanks. You position the barrel here, you kite back, then you Q it. Oh, brilliant. And then she she knows that she's dead and you get the autos off because instead of trading autos with you, she's running. And those are the moments where you can get the autos off is when they're not committing to a fight like that. So right here is when you should probably back out. Like, you still got them pretty low. I mean, Tom Kinch can use his thick skin and you saw the health, like that's his health yeah. currently. This is the moment where you should have gotten out like a little bit sooner than that. Instead of turning to go back in, that should have been the moment where you just continue to run back. Buy home guard boots, then go back into the fight. When the fight's so close to your base like this, well, your team just needs to come around and clean it up too. Um, a lot of times you'll see like really strong carries in high elo. They'll recall at like half health in a really long or extended fight. Or not even recall, just walk back. Get home guard boots. They're full HP, full mana again, and they're back in the fight in a couple seconds. And um, that's what I would have done there. It's just back out, get home guard boots, and come right back into the fight. And you went a little bit tanky, too. If you get a lifesteal item, that's fine with Spirit Visage, plus your W. I like it. Um, their team had a bit of magic, too, on, like, the Syndra, Tom Kench, Nautilus. And, um, yeah, like, t if you if you know you have to team fight with Gangplank, like, getting a bit of health is fine. Like, y you definitely have enough damage at this point to carry the fights. So making sure that you stay alive is, is, is good. And then I think your team should have done Baron. Like, right after... Right when you recalled and survived and went back to base is when you should have been pinging Baron like mad. Because okay. almost everyone in the enemy team was dead. Your team ended up just doing Dragon, which is okay, but Baron was definitely the, the main priority there. Um, your ultimate here wasn't that effective because Riven didn't commit to run away there and your team wasn't like chasing. So it would have been better to save it. If that was connected, that would have been huge on her. Yeah, I was finding uh, Syndra quite... Uh, troublesome because she kept popping my barrels. She always used to dive. Yeah. She dives into the fight to pop them. When you're when you're playing against a gangplank, that's what you got to be looking to do is to last hit the barrel before gangplank does to deny it. But it's risky because if you're a melee champion and you're in range to do that, you're also in range to to get hit by it if you don't time it right. Really, the only thing that I'm seeing that could be why your team might end up losing this is because there's no objectives taken after you carry the team fights. Um, and then a, a really long extended fight like this happens. And it just, it's, these are the fights you want to avoid doing because your team isn't alive afterwards to help you uh, do Baron. Okay. Yeah, this guy's got thorn mail. You're, you're end up, you're almost killing yourself. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, the, that's the thing. I hadn't looked at the items at this point. You still lived. Yeah, Baron, 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 Baron. Like, two of them are dead. Like, you gotta, like, one thing about uh, games below Diamond or even in Diamond and stuff like that, like, teams don't pull the trigger on the Baron. Did you see my Nunu game uh, earlier? Uh, yeah, I was watching that. Did you, did yeah, you that, see that the part where we did the Baron? That won the game. Didn't yeah, you? exactly. Yeah. So, Baron is, like, exactly how you pull the trigger after having this huge lead as a carry. Get your team to do Baron. Like, you just, you've been carrying these team fights through and through. Um, but doing Baron now is a little bit too delayed. It has to be, like, immediate. After that fight, that skirmish where you killed two of them, you force a 3v5 fight around Baron. I mean, it's risky, but, like, it's better than delaying the game and, like, continuing these fights without getting a big objective because the Baron is what closes the game out. Like, it helps your team end it. Okay, you got to pick there. Your team will hopefully kill this guy as well. This should be an ace, or at least close to it. Okay, rather than t in chasing, your your team got to go do Baron. All right, well, that's fine too. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys are gonna kill them anyways. Yeah, I think like, we're just yeah. so far ahead in kills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's the end of the game yeah. right there. But as a rule of thumb, right right about this moment. Like, even if you can kill the Riven, most of the time it's just better. Like, this fight gets pretty extended. Um, it gets just better to back off and just do the Baron right away so you can start pushing right after. You know, killing Riven it would be... It's, it's still a good idea. Like, if you're able to do it cleanly, but, like, meh, you're, you're able to still get it. But it's just... The main principle is that I wanted to talk about is, like, before this moment had happened, 
I think your team should have gotten a Baron to seal the deal. And as a top laner, like, you sometimes have to, you can't always, like, be the one that gets your team to do it. But, like, you should definitely encourage your team to want to do it. I mean, they know to do it now, but 37 minute mark. A lot of time Barons happen at 25 minutes very easily. Barons, easy to do. It's just a matter of, like, working with your team to deny vision and also to, uh, like, know what you're capable of doing with the champions you have. And right here, I, I like that you, uh, I would, ooh. Oh my. Oh my. I like that you went for the inhibitor while your team was, was doing Baron. That was smart because your team didn't need everyone to go do Baron. Like, Baron doesn't, Baron's not that hard, uh, especially this late in the game. So that really diversified, like, how much of an advantage you guys got from winning that last team fight. And if you watch the pro games, or even in high-elo games, after... Like, at, there, like, there's like a small window where you can make plays after team fights, where they, where the enemy team just can't retaliate. Like, while the enemy team's dead, they can't retaliate. And like, what you do in those small windows after winning team fights is what seals the deal of the games. And that was like, a, you know, it was pretty good. Like, I like how you played it. It was, it was still really close, and you knew, or it seemed that you knew exactly what you could do, and you turned it, turned it around, and still killed Syndra. But um. Got to pull the Baron trigger a little bit earlier, but I, I like I like your play with Gangplank. Um, you said that you just started playing him. Yeah, I've got about ten games on him. Nice man. No, you definitely hard carried this game. Like, there there's that, there was also mo moments in this game where you could have carried harder, which is what I hope we we went across this game. Um, yeah, I thought because like I did well in kills, but yeah. I knew there was obviously gameplay that I could have done because being this far ahead, it shouldn't have taken forty minutes to win the game. Right. But you'll get to that point. Don't worry about it. You'll definitely get to the point where you're, you'll uh, you'll do what you basically do to the Riven early game, and you'll press that advantage, and it'll be like a 25-minute game. You're t you'll get your team to do Baron, and then they'll just like give up once you have that advantage. Really good ult here. They're they're like walking through the choke point. Oh my word, your damage so high. Yeah. No, that was that was huge. You like single-handedly got like the entire enemy team to half health before the fight started. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, and that's GG. It looks like, yeah. Yeah, that's the end of it. Cool. I'm pretty sure that's the end of it. All right, man. That was a uh, was a good game. Yeah, I don't know what the team is doing there though, because like we've got an open inhibitor and they just carried on trying to mid instead of coming up top. But, right, right. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's that's just platinum, man. What, what, the only thing you can really do from your standpoint, like, you're not going to ever, like, get Platinum players to play better than Platinum, you know? But okay. what you can do is um, try to influence your team with your decisions and maybe shot call a little bit differently during moments where you carry team fights as hard as you did to get objectives after. And then, like, you know, it's a ride. So look, was a ride. Do you have any... Yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any more questions? Uh, no, that was the main things that like, you told me how to push the objectives, the warding, the TP plays. Yep. So, uh, you know, focus on poking more with Gangplank during laning phase. Um, de definitely ward more. Upgrade your Trinket Ward at level 9. Every game is a top laner. It's even more important than like mid lane, making sure that you have that upgraded because it's you're more ward dependent top lane. If you're winning lane, keep a pink ward um, top lane. Like You just have control of the lane. You want to do that. Teleport plays. We went into detail about that. Don't uh, don't leave top too early with your teleports unless they're guaranteed plays. On Gangplank, if we're talking about Gangplank, I would say most of the time, only teleport if it's directly in behind them from their point of safety. So if you can like teleport to a ward behind them and they're really overextended in an all-in play, um, or it's for like a dragon or something like that. Otherwise, just keep abusing your advantage top lane because if you leave top too soon and their top laner stays top and you don't get too much out of it. Like, there will be that small, small window where they'll start to catch back up and bad things can happen from that. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks, Tom. I, uh, well, I had fun doing this, and I'll get you the recording of that, and uh, you'll be able to go back over it and get all that juicy bits of information we went over, especially during the early portions of the laning phase. I was just going ham. With all the <laughs> yeah, I think I was trying to absorb all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. Uh, thanks, Tom. And, well, thank uh, you very much for that. No problem. Uh, talk to you later. See ya, man. Yeah, see ya. Cool. So uh, Tom is uh, 
Learning top lane, he is plat 3 on EU West. And uh, thank you, Tom. That's a coaching session with me. I try to do coaching sessions uh, usually during my stream, but I can also do it uh, out of the stream as well. Um, I need to spectate a game.